As we shift towards using more SMD components, hand soldering just isn't practical anymore. It's time consuming and it's very easy to mess up, so we decided to upgrade our setup with a custom build solution. This video will walk you through the entire journey, from picking the right parts and designing the control system to overcoming tricky challenges and assembling everything into a fully functional reflow oven. So why take the DIY route? Desktop reflow ovens are expensive. The cheap ones go for over $300 and even then, they sometimes need modifications. Building one ourselves gives us full control and saves us a lot of money. Our main goal is to build an oven that can handle lead-free solder paste which typically requires peak temperatures of around 250 degrees Celsius. But it isn't just about hitting that high temperature. A proper reflow profile has multiple zones, so our oven needs to be able to follow that temperature profile curve as close as possible. Here's a look at the parts and design choices we made for this project. We went with this particular toaster oven because it has a flat front panel, which makes it easy for us to design a new one to replace it. If we want to regulate the temperature in the oven, we need to be able to measure it. For this, we are going to be using a K-type thermocouple since it's suited for measuring high temperatures. Here is how a thermocouple works. Two dissimilar metals are connected at the hot junction and at the cold junction. When there's a temperature difference between these two junctions, there's a potential difference across them according to the Seebeck effect. The voltage seen here is proportional to the temperature difference between the two junctions. So to actually determine the temperature at the hot junction, the temperature at the cold junction must be known. Thankfully, the Max 31855K chip takes care of this, and so we only have to plug in the thermocouple, and it will provide the temperature readings for the microcontroller. The microcontroller we are going with is the ESP32. It takes the temperature readings and runs a PID control loop. Our PID control loop is basically a smart algorithm that figures out how much heating is needed to precisely follow a temperature profile. To control the heating element's power, we are using a solid state relay. It works a lot like dimming an LED with PWM. By adjusting the duty cycle of the control signal, we can control how much power the heater receives. For the user interface, we've added a touchscreen display to control the oven, along with a buzzer and some LEDs to provide visual and audio feedback. So here's a diagram showing you how everything is connected. The thermocouple measures the oven's temperature and sends the data to the ESP32. The ESP32 runs the PID algorithm and based on the results, it adjusts the duty cycle of a 10 Hz PWM signal. This signal controls the solid state relay, which in turn regulates the power going into the heating element. The toaster oven also includes a fan, so we've added the relay to switch it on and off as needed. The ESP32 also handles the user interface, keeping the user informed throughout the reflow process. To keep all the electronics organized, we designed a two layer PCB. This PCB includes a back converter to provide 3.3 volts for the ESP32, along with circuitry for the thermocouple and other peripherals. Once the PCB was ready, we needed to get it fabricated, and that's where this video sponsor, GLC PCB, comes in. GLC PCB provides PCB and assembly services for both hobbyists and professionals. They make ordering PCBs incredibly easy. You just upload your GEBA files, get an instant quote, and place your order. Their services are super affordable too. You can get 1 to 8 layer boards for just $2, and thanks to their fully in house production process, you get consistent quality, reliable turnaround times, and production speeds as fast as 24 hours. They are currently running a promotion where you get $30 off a 6 layer PCB. This PCB comes with unique finish and no extra cost for VI in part. You can find links down in the description if you want to check it out. Okay, with the plan set, it's time for us to start the build. I started off by soldering the headers on the board for the ESP32 and the LCD screen. Then I soldered on the back converter and tested it to ensure it's outputting 3.3 volts before soldering on the thermocouple IC. The next step is to measure how quickly the oven heats up so we can figure out if any insulation is needed. We first tried using a multimeter for this, but the cable couldn't handle the high temperatures. So we've ordered a new cable which is rated for much higher temperatures and with that, we should be able to make measurements now. Here is where I ran into a problem. The thermocouple IC wasn't giving me any temperature readings. I thought the chip was faulty, so I ordered a new module from Amazon to test it out. But even this one didn't work. After some digging, I realized the fix was simple. Switching the pins from hardware SPI to software SPI did the trick. Now it's time to start collecting temperature data. 
I've programmed the ESP32 to send temperature readings every second over serial, and I have written a Python script that grabs those readings and saves them into a CSV file. Once the recording is done, I'll plot the temperature over time and compare it to the recommended reflow profile. Now it's time to analyze the results. First off, the oven takes way too long to reach peak temperature. The reflow process should hit max temp in about 240 seconds. But right now, it's taking around 350 seconds. And that's even without a soak zone. Also, the ramp in the reflow zone is too slow. 145 seconds instead of a target of 60 seconds. So yeah, we will definitely need to improve the insulation. For the insulation, we ordered some fiber insulation from AliExpress and took apart the toaster oven to install it. Be careful when working with this fiberglass insulation. It gets everywhere and is also very itchy and difficult to get off your skin. To help cut down the heat loss through the glass, we also covered the window with heat resistant tape, which was also from AliExpress. With the insulation in place, we run another test to see how much of a difference it made. It now takes just 160 seconds to hit 250 degrees Celsius, which is a big improvement. Even better, the reflow stage now only takes 50 seconds, beating the target time by 10 seconds. So far, things are looking promising. We can now move on to the PID algorithm. Here is the function. It takes a single parameter, SP, which stands for set point. The function checks if enough time has passed since the last PID update by comparing the current time with the last recorded time. The control loop only runs if that difference is greater than one second. This prevents the PID from updating too frequently, which could cause unstable behavior. Inside the loop, we calculate the error, the difference between the current and the target temperature. The error goes into the PID algorithm to generate an output signal for the heating element. We won't dive into the math behind PID or PD control in this video. There are already plenty of resources out there if you want to explore that in detail. The output of the PD algorithm is mapped to a range of 0 to 255. This value sets the duty cycle for the PWM signal that controls the solid state relay, which in turn adjusts the power going into the heating element. Now that we've gone over the code, we can put it to the test. Here, we set the temperature to 50 degrees Celsius, but it settles around 48 degrees. The integral term will typically fix the steady state error, but we aren't using it because we need to follow a dynamic profile. The PD code is working as expected, so we can now test the full reflow profile. Here are the results of the initial test. The algorithm doesn't do a great job following the curve, so I tweaked the PD values and tested different configurations till I landed on one that was able to closely match the target curve. We have everything set for a reflow test with the PCB. Here, I just put solder paste on the PCB just to see if it actually reflows. And here is where we hit a major roadblock. We noticed some brown marks on our test PCB but assumed it was normal until we tried reflowing actual airflow sensors and they melted. At this point, we realized our temperature readings were much lower than what they actually were. We spent weeks troubleshooting everything, checked the code, tried a different thermocouple module, and even ordered new PCBs. Nothing worked. Honestly, we were ready to give up until we came across a PT100 RTD module. It could measure the temperature range we needed, but the cable was only weighted up to 200 degrees Celsius, which was a concern. But at that point, we were out of options, so we went ahead with it. In the initial test, it wasn't responsive to temperature changes, but after removing the tape around the sensor, the readings became much more responsive, and most importantly, it was way more accurate than the thermocouple. It also uses SPI, so adopting it was straightforward. We just needed to replace the driver and solder some hookup wires to bypass the onboard thermocouple IC. But how does this sensor work? A PT100 is a type of resistance temperature detector. Unlike thermocouples which generate voltage based on temperature differences, the PT100 RTD works by measuring the resistance of a tiny strip of platinum. As the temperature rises, the resistance also rises. The reason why it is more accurate in this case is that 
Its resistance varies almost linearly with temperature. Thermocouples, on the other hand, have a nonlinear response, but the IC assumes it's linear, so we get wrong values at high temperatures. We are finally at the stage where we can begin assembling the reflow open. We started by designing a custom front panel in Fusion 360 to replace the existing one. This new panel includes cutouts for the LCD screen, LEDs, the power button, and the USB extension cable. To install the panel, we created a cutout in the existing one and attached the new one using screws. We then connected all the components together and closed up the oven. We made sure to add a lot of insulation around the electronics to protect them from exposure to excessive heat. Now that the oven is assembled, let's talk about the user interface. We used Illustrator to design the pages and converted it to C code using this website. This method uses a lot of flash, but then it gives us full control over the UI design. We then ran the initial test to verify that the heating element was functioning correctly and that the UI responded as expected. After a successful test, the oven is finally ready for actual use. For the first run, we reflowed a board from a project we've been working on. The results were promising. There are no burn marks and the solder paste reflowed nicely. There were a few minor solder bridges on the LKFP packages, but those are easy to fix with the soldering iron. Overall, we are really pleased with how the oven turned out. If you are interested in building one yourself, the GitHub repo is linked in the description below. And that's our DIY reflow oven build process. The result is a regular toaster oven turned into a pretty useful tool for our SMD soldering needs. We hope you found this look into our project interesting and informative. If you enjoyed seeing the process, we'd appreciate a thumbs up and consider subscribing if you want to see more of our projects in the future. Thanks for watching.